Hello, and welcome to Let's Talk, a Tulsa World virtual town hall meeting. I'm Wayne Green, Editorial Pages Editor of the Tulsa World. Today's town hall is graciously underwritten by the George Kaiser Family Foundation. Today, we're going to be talking about current events facing Oklahoma's premier state universities with their university, uh, I'm sorry, Oklahoma State University President Burns Hargis and University of Oklahoma President Joe Harris Jr. Welcome, gentlemen. Glad to be here. We, uh, we asked our readers what questions they'd like to see asked today, and I want to get to many of those, as many of those questions as we can. But first, I want to give each of you a chance to comment on, on current issues facing your, your schools. It's, it's been a difficult time for the state's flagship universities, in part because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the George Floyd uh, killing and other national and local issues that are largely beyond your control. So in two minutes or less, gentlemen, what is the state of your school today? Uh, President Hargis, let's start with you. Well, I'm, I'm happy to report that OSU is alive and well. Uh, we're, uh, success, we successfully completed the uh, spring semester, which was no easy feat, uh, converting to online over a week. I mean, we had a number of faculty that needed a lot of help uh, to, uh, to uh, go through that conversion and finish the semester. But uh, we, did, we did that, that was great. Uh, we've spent a lot of time and still continue to spend a lot of time preparing for uh, our students coming back in the fall. Uh, enrollment looks good. Uh, we also are assisting uh, our state uh, response to the COVID-19 in a number of ways that I think we may talk about a little bit later. Uh, our Board of Regents approved a budget uh, for, uh, for OSU and the entire system. Uh, there, uh, with tuition and fees, mandatory fees remaining flat again, uh, except for OSU IT in Okmulgee has a 4% increase. So uh, we, we're mindful of the, uh, of the needs and the economic situation of our, of our family. Um, and um, we're, we're, we're uh, also working hard, as I'm sure Joe will comment on, on, on how we're going to do football this year. Well, uh, we'll we'll be talking about that here in a minute. I guarantee you, uh, President Harris. What's how, how are things going in Norman? Things are going well, and I just want to add that uh, Burns has always been a friend, uh, but I don't believe he engaged in full disclosure on what being a college president uh, was going to be like. Uh, certainly during these times, the uh, it is the university is is doing well. These are challenging times. Uh, so, from a very broad brush. Uh, uh, 40,000 feet, uh, this, as Burns indicated, the transition to online went uh, stunningly well. Didn't miss a single day of classes, but, uh, but the reality is, is in-person is, uh, is, uh, is fundamentally important. The uh, class makeup coming into this next year, uh, a lot of universities across the country are down 15, 20% in terms of their entering class, uh, OSU and OU. Uh, from what I understand, uh, certainly uh, I know from the OU side, we're down about 1%, 2% in terms of uh, the overall class. So way ahead of national trends, uh, our dorms are, are full, 95% uh, occupancy for, uh, for those, and a lot of preparations going into how we handle uh, returning during the time of a pandemic. And so every day we're working on the specifics of how we return. Uh, you know, the current environment obviously has to include a discussion about race. Uh, it's an issue that is uh, uh, attached to every institution, but, it, but especially uh, at comprehensive research universities. Uh, we spent a lot of time, certainly prior to this summer, working on how do you make uh, real and meaningful uh, and lasting systemic change. Uh, the uh, tragedies of this summer certainly highlight that even more. I'm sure we'll talk about it, but uh, very honest conversation about race, uh, about equality, and how we manage those things on a college campus. Uh, in terms of the overall strategy of the university, we have not had a written strategic plan, uh, to my knowledge, in at least 30 years. We've worked for the last year on that. We uh, hopefully will get through the, uh, the Norman campus piece of that uh, with a final plan over the coming uh, weeks as we head into the end of July. Uh, and I'm enthusiastic about it. It lays out, it will lay out what our plan is, um, what our goals are, uh, what matters to us in a very clear way that allows us to have a very clean and clear strategy for our three campuses. And then finally, I think what we've seen over the course of the pandemic and with the race issues that are out there, 
um, is what that role is of a comprehensive research university. And finally, I'd say, uh, I, I believe we'll talk more about this later, uh, uh, putting the university in a position of not just strategic opportunity, but financial health to accomplish that. Uh, we've made big strides the last uh, year and a half, two years, and I think we're well positioned. Okay, gentlemen, first question I want to pose to you comes from a reader who's obviously concerned about the COVID-19 situation. She asked, how often will students be tested during the fall semester, and will the testing be covered under the cost of ordinary tuition and fees? And I'm going to ask you also to, uh, to answer that question, but also uh, to brief us on what measures your schools have taken to protect students, faculty, staff, and the general public against COVID-19 transmission. Chris, let's start with you. Yeah, th this, is, this is complicated, and we all want answers right now. Uh, uh, I can tell you the answers we have and the answers that we don't have yet. Uh, first of all, what we've done is been able to, um, to draw on our health sciences center and the expertise uh, that exists there. So from public health, uh, epidemiology, obviously, to our, uh, to our uh, tertiary and quaternary physician practice, uh, that includes great researchers. So there's a wealth of, of knowledge coming into us. But the question is, how do you react and how do you, um, how do you bring back uh, what is a uniquely large and in-person gathering of students? One of the comments I love is that we'll learn more in the next 30 days than we've learned in the last 100. But I can tell you what we're doing, and that is uh, we have uh, emergency operation centers on each of the campuses. All of the information on COVID goes through them. Um, and ultimately through, we appointed a chief COVID officer, Dr. Bratzler, who has both public health uh, and physician credentials to be a coordinating influence for this. So uh, the plan is very long. We'll be announcing additional elements tomorrow. Uh, but uh, essentially the, the keys to this will be um, the big macro initiatives we have. We have one around making sure the campus is as clean as it can be called our clean and green initiative. And I could break that down into its sub elements. We also have um, how we're going to return to our classes. We call it the safe and resilient class um, uh, resumption. We'll also be announcing very shortly that masks are going to be an essential part of this return. We've also spent uh, $5.2 million just on the cleaning side. Uh, we have over half a million masks ready for our students as they return. Um, and in all of our housing units, in all of the uh, towers that we have, uh, we just made a uh, a two and a half million dollar acquisition of, spe of special filtration devices, uh, 2,300 uh, antimicrobial devices in the rooms to help in keeping those clean. And obviously across our campuses, we're working on additional air filter devices that are out there. Now, when it comes directly to this question of testing, that's still a work in progress. It will, it will likely be the following, although we're still working on and refining it. It will likely be screening that takes place on a regular, likely daily basis. Uh, and then those that have any of the indicators um, that, are, that, that indicate a higher propensity for having it, those individuals will be required to, um, to have a test. Uh, and then we'll work off of those tests. Uh, also be working with the state health department and local health departments uh, for those that do test positive to do uh, not just the testing, but also um, the, uh, the tracing. Are, are, you mentioned masks. Are they going to be required for every student in every classroom, every faculty member? Yeah, we, this, we have, we will be officially laying out the specifics of this, but, uh, and I just finished a call on this this morning. As you can imagine, this is a round the clock uh, matter to handle. But uh, when you look at how we can be together uh, in these spaces, masking is an essential part of this. And so in the classrooms, uh, everyone will need to have a mask on to allow it to be safe uh, for those that are in there. And the safety, and this is a message we'll be working on, the safety is, is certainly not just for the individual who's wearing the mask, but it's actually a, a larger concern for those, uh, even if you don't have, um, if, even if you're not you know, highly at risk, uh, others are. And so from what we can tell, masking is the best preventative measure that's out there right now. So the answer is yes. Well, President Hargis, uh, what's the OSU uh, plan? President Hargis, uh, you're, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, we have, uh, we actually have what's called the Cowboys Coming Back plan, as a matter of fact, and it's, it goes into a lot of the same detail that uh, Joe was referring to starting next week. Uh, we will be offering free tests uh, 
to uh, all of our employees, all of our students and their families. Uh, and uh, actually we're gonna encourage students before they come back to get tested as well. Uh, anybody going, anybody uh, residing in the dorms will be tested when they, uh, when they arrive and we will actually do the uh, move in phasing over a period of, uh, a period of days. Uh, the, uh, Joe's right, I mean, the, the, when you wear a mask, you're really protecting other people rather than yourself. And so that's just got to be part of our, uh, part of our ethos. Uh, we're uh, also uh, going to maintain the social distancing in the classrooms as much as possible. The, uh, we're actually, some, some non-traditional areas like the Student Union Ballroom, like gallagher Abba Arena, uh, West Watkins Center, a lot of these different places that don't normally host classes will be hosting classes. Uh, we're, uh, you'll have assigned seating in each class uh, so we can do contact tracing in case we have a live uh, or a positive. Uh, uh, we'll of course have daily cleaning, uh, uh, extensive fogging and all the other uh, techniques to eliminate uh, the disease. Uh, if a student uh, or a faculty member test, well, if it's a student, uh, we have quarantine space set aside so they can uh, uh, quarantine for 14 days. Uh, if it's a faculty or an employee, they likely have a home that they can go home to and stay for 14 days. Uh, the, uh, we're actually going to end the uh, semester, uh, the, the in-person semester at Thanksgiving and then go online there's, we only have two weeks after Thanksgiving, so uh, that one week is dead week, we call it, and then the next one is finals week. Uh, so uh, we, we, think it's, it's a, we think it's a good plan, but it's a very challenging plan. And as that great philosopher Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until you get hit. Have, have, you, have you moved more and more classes to online only? Uh, no. And are some well, of them moving sort of after students enroll in them? Yeah, yeah. The, the problem is being able to social distance the students. And so some of the classes will be hybrid where you could, there'll be what we call synchronous. It'll, it'll be a, a live class at 9.30 or whatever time it is, but you may join by uh, Zoom and uh, take the class that way. Uh, there'll, be, there'll be instances where a professor may have diabetes and uh, needs to teach through Zoom to a live classroom. So there'll be a number of, but, but mainly we're trying to get every class we possibly can in person uh, if the student wants to do that. The student can attend uh, uh, virtually if, uh, if, they, if they desire or they have to because they're quarantined. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's got to be a certain amount of, of uh, improvisation involved in it though. I mean, you might start off thinking the class is going to be largely in person and then just for whatever reason determine, yeah, we just can't do it. I'm sorry, we're going to, we're going to be online. There's no doubt that there's going to be those kinds of decisions that have to be made as we go along. I mean, if you, if you happen to have a class where a good part of the class is tested positive, uh, then you need to go, you need to go online. But we think it's important, especially with freshmen, uh, for the case for the class to be if it is online it's synchronous so there is a time they've got to show up and attendance is taken and uh, move forward hopefully that'll this will just have to be a, a, a work in progress this semester uh, but uh, absent a vaccine I'm not sure how long how long this will last yeah so so from a more positive perspective I know I know both OU and OSU have been actively looking for ways to keep Oklahomans as safe as possible from COVID-19. That, that includes testing and treatment, and research, expert advice to our, to our state's top policymakers. What have been the highlights of, of those efforts from your perspective, uh, your perspective, President Hargis? Well, I think there have been a lot of highlights. And, and uh, in fact, uh, I'm most proud. Of, I didn't have anything to do with it, honestly, but in record time, uh, a partnership was formed between OSU Medicine and uh, the OSU Research Area and the Veterinary College uh, to do diagnostic testing. And uh, we actually uh, 
set it up in just a matter of days and doubled the amount of testing that was going on uh, in uh, uh, in Oklahoma. And uh, it, it was a, it was a great partnership. In fact, we uh, we're we're processing about two thousand tests per day. We're not we're not taking the test necessarily, but we're analyzing the test for uh, for the COVID. Uh, the uh, Casey Schramm, of course, is the, our dean and uh, dean of the OSU Medicine and also the Health Science Center, and she has been a leader on the governor's task force on this area and uh, been very involved in uh, extensive work of treating patients, mobile testing, uh, expanded telehealth, health, uh, modeling and contact tracing. And uh, our Endeavor Lab, which is our engineering school, is uh, using 3D printing to produce uh, masks, the shields, uh, face shields uh, for anybody who wants them. I think they cost, I don't know, a buck a piece or something like that. And uh, it, of course our extension services in every county have been very active in, in uh, providing information and, uh, and health alerts to, uh, to their area. So it's been a it's been a busy time, and uh, I'm I'm pleased that we've been able to be of this service to the state. President Harris, what's that, what do you have to say for itself on this? Yeah, it it certainly shows why it's important for a, a state to have great uh, research universities. A few examples, and Burns has covered them well. Um, at the you know we have the largest physician practice group in the state uh, at the OU College of Medicine, and their expertise. Um, you know, we refer to these subspecialists as tertiary and quaternary um, experts uh, in their field. And uh, from public health to infectious disease, uh, our experts have been helping out with the mayors and the governor uh, and um, uh, in working on helping define and understand the disease. Uh, big campaigns to help the public as a whole. We launched the uh, Stop the Spread campaign and the Million Mask uh, Challenge. Uh, looking at new clinical treatments uh, and trials, uh, we treated uh, the first patient in Oklahoma with convalescent uh, plasma, uh, providing new treatments to the sickest patients. Uh, among those looking for a vaccine uh, are the OU researchers. Dr. Hildebrand uh, is leading one of those investigations uh, in the pursuit of a COVID-19 vaccine. So obviously that's um, exciting and hopeful and important and something that can only take place at a research university. The uh, uh, diagnostic testing and research is also important, trying a new platform. Uh, uh, outreach, our College of Nursing has done uh, these drive-through testings with the Oklahoma State Health Department. Um, also interesting partnerships between uh, the College of Medicine and the Norman campus um, and other folks. Uh, we've looked into uh, researching the other facets of COVID outside of the strictly medical, but those things uh, that attend to it um, from uh, COVID-19's effect on uh, child mental health and rural tribal communities uh, to public health responses. And uh, as Burns indicated, we're also doing 3D uh, printing uh, for respirator designs uh, that are there. So it really does show uh, the interconnectivity of what a comprehensive research university can do. And, and people often think about the uh, OU Health Science Center um, and the OU hospital is being somehow separate from the rest of OU. And the truth of the matter is um, our three campuses all work together. And this is a good example of where it comes together. You know, one, one last COVID question. And I guess it's a reminder that we do live in Oklahoma. Uh, are we going to have college football in Gaylord family and, and Boone Pickens Stadium this fall? And will there be fans in the seats? Will every seat be available? Uh, how's you know, college football is important in Oklahoma. How's it going to be different this year uh, compared to the way it's been in the past? Uh, President Harris? Yeah, it's, uh, it is, um, we're going to have football. The question is in what form it comes. And Burns and I uh, meet on this every two weeks. Uh, we just had our most recent call with the rest of the Big 12 CEOs uh, yesterday evening. Uh, it is an ongoing question and President Hargis serves on uh, a number of important NCAA committees that are in and around this. Uh, the reality is, is that these answers are going to come, you know, we know we're going to play football. The question is, what will the occupancy um, of the stadiums look like? And that's dependent upon two separate 
groups. We don't control necessarily all of our own destiny on this. We have the, you know, on the regulatory side, it's the NCAA, it's the Big 12 Conference itself. Um, and then, you know, on the state and local government side, obviously, there's also the interplay of the governor and the mayors uh, that attach to this. And of course, our own boards. Um, I believe, you know, Burns and I talk about it a lot. I think that we're going to have college football. Um, we're going to have fans, I believe. The question is, uh, how many and, and, and how do you handle that? And we are working on it in real time. Uh, I do believe that, uh, and we haven't had these specifics yet, but masks are going to be a key part of this. Uh, really, when you look at how we can get together and how we can be together, uh, masks are going to be an essential element to how we are able to get together. Uh, we've all seen the increase in cases. You know, it's amazing how much a few days difference makes. Uh, if you'd asked us a week ago, things looked really bright. Uh, over the course of the last several days, uh, we saw the numbers, and you have to throw Mondays out because of the way the testing works. Um, but we've seen the, 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 the curve bend the wrong direction. Um, and so, you know, as we go into August, uh, I think we'll have these answers probably mid to late July. But uh, until then, it's speculation, I think, about just how full these stadiums are going to be. Now, Burns may have more insights. So I just want to make sure I think I heard, heard what I thought I heard. Are you saying there's really zero chance that we're not going to have football this, this fall in Oklahoma? Oh, I don't think you can say zero just because this is such an unpredictable virus. I can tell you that, that right now it's our belief that we will have it and be playing football. Now, there's obviously questions about conference versus non-conference games uh, and how you manage those. Uh, the current plan is to, is to play all of them. Um, but as we've said a lot, we don't control this virus. Uh, it, it may control us. But as of right now, every intention is to play. President uh, Hargis, uh, football is a contact sport. So if, if one guy has something, it's not hard to believe that every guy on the field might have it pretty fast. Uh, what's, what's OSU's philosophy on this? Well, I, th I think it all starts with uh, keeping everybody safe. Uh, you've, got, you've got the players and you've got the coaches and you've got the referees and you've got a, just a lot of people that uh, you, you need to protect to the extent you possibly can. Uh, really, as to the zero chance, you know, we, we, uh, we play a full season and full menu of games, but maybe the team you play that week isn't going to travel, or maybe they've had too much in the way of COVID and, uh, and can't play the game. So it, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a just kind of catch as catch can as we go down the, go down the road here, uh, as far as fans in the stands, uh, I think I think you could come up with a method where we could have have fans in the stands. I doubt that you can fill them up, uh, but you could probably social distance if you had a certain number and, and with family sitting sitting together. Uh, so that's I think a possibility. Uh, but uh, we're testing. Uh, we're we have hyper cleaning going on. And uh, I, think, I think with any of the Division I schools, you're gonna probably have that. Uh, so it, it could be if, if you're playing a non-conference game against a Division II school, they may not have the resources to, uh, to do that. So it's, uh, it's gonna be a, a huge challenge, but it's, it's, uh, football is important in Oklahoma. It's important to the universities. It's important to our alumni. And, and we wanna do everything we can to get the football season in. The, the two universities have a combined staff football salary of, of more than $20 million. Uh, and it's not hard to anticipate that if, if you, you know, if you're spacing people out in the stands or just some people just aren't interested in, in, in coming to a, uh, to the sort of event during the, during the pandemic that, you know, you might have some more, quite a few more empty seats, which that develops into a revenue problem uh, for your schools. How do you balance off the cost of football on your campuses with those issues? Uh, let's, President uh, uh, Hargis. Well, you're right. It's a, it's a very important, uh, in our case, uh, football provides about 85% of our total athletic budget. And a lot of that, come, of course, comes from television revenue, but there, there are gate receipts. There are ticket uh, sales that uh, play a big part. So you're definitely, if your, fan, if your stands aren't, 
if your fans are not filling the stands, uh, you're going to have a revenue hit. There's no question about it. And uh, we, we just have to right-size the organization, right-size the compensation uh, to, uh, to fit reality. And uh, we'll, we'll see, but that's, that's nothing we can figure out right now. I mean, we know that we're going to have less revenues. And that affects football basically takes care of all the other sports. So it's a, it wouldn't just affect football if we didn't play. It's going to affect everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, President Harris, uh, big revenue uh, sport, football at, at OU. What, uh, how are you going to be able to pay the bills? Yeah, it's uh, – yeah, I mean, just to amplify the, the question itself, um, total athletics budget's $175 million. Uh, football accounts for – uh, north of 110 million of that, uh, a little north of that. So it's a real question. Um, we're fortunate to have an enterprise that's paid its own way for a very long time. Uh, and, uh, but the reality is this year, under any scenario, we had to submit our FY21 budgets and we had to put a real number in and, and there's no bigger guesswork than what an FY21 budget looks like, but, um, but we've got a really good board and, um, and good professionals, and we looked at it, and while there is a lot of variability in this, uh, we thought that a conservative, uh, you know, realistic estimate, uh, realizing that tomorrow could change everything, uh, is it will probably lose around $50 million, 40 to $50 million, uh, and that's what we have in our budget uh, for FY21 as a potential loss. Now, um, uh, yes, you, you, we're, we're going to then have to figure out how you handle that um, and how you move through it. It's important to us that, that we're one of the few schools where athletics pays its own way uh, and in some ways, you know, pays back financially to the rest of the university. So um, it's going to be a tough year. There's no way to honestly look at it and say it's not going to be. Um, is it better than a $50 million loss? I, I certainly hope so, and we'll work on that. But uh, that's our thought on what it probably looks like this year, um, you know, looking at it a week ago, and we'll continue to monitor it, and we'll make the adjustments we need to, uh, as President Hargis said, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to write that um, in real time. I might, I might add, if I may, uh, it's not just football. I mean, we had to cancel the Big 12 basketball tournament and March Madness, which was about a 500 and. 30 or $40 million decision for the NCAA. Now they had some business interruption insurance and, and might get a couple of hundred million of that back, but uh, that's also fitting into our uh, FY21 situation. Wow. So let's shift gears, gentlemen. Uh, even before the death of George Floyd, uh, both of your schools were dealing with the passionate concerns of, of black students on campus. President Harris, your office was occupied by students earlier this year. President Hargis, your football coach has taken some criticize, uh, criticism recently from the public and current and past OSU athletes. What assurances can, can the two of you offer me today, uh, offer black students, faculty, staff, that the uh, opportunity to attend your schools, that they can attend your schools without fear and in an equitable atmosphere? President Hargis, we'll start with you this time. Well, it's, uh, some criticism is kind of an understatement uh, of Coach Gundy uh, uh, activities, but he realizes he he made a he 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 made a mistake. He aired, uh He was insensitive. He knows that, and he's working uh, hard to rectify those concerns with his with his team. Uh, but diversity and inclusion has been a high priority from day one. At, I came to this job a little over 12 years ago, and uh, I heard too many horror stories of the old days from uh, F people of color. And uh, so we, we worked hard, immediately hired a vice president of diversity to work on, uh, on the in environment and to get, to bring, bring people of color more into the mainstream of the university. And uh, I, think, I think we've done a good job of that. I, I'm, I'm proud to say that the two of the last three uh, student body presidents uh, were black. Uh, in fact, believe it or not, the, uh, the president of the Interfraternity Council is black. And uh, so they're, they're, we've worked hard to move everybody into the mainstream. And we just have to constantly uh, not only say, but act, 
act as, uh, as we value and respect all students. And uh, we treat them all the same. And we give them all every advantage we possibly can. And we are committed to addressing any racism uh, or inequality that goes on on our campus. President Harris, I remember um, the day you got your job or maybe the day after you came to Tulsa and the first thing you brought up was, was dealing with this issue. Uh, you making any progress? Yeah, uh, when I came in uh, on the interim basis uh, 13 months ago, uh, I've said the most important thing we can do um, is get diversity and equity, uh, specifically race and ethnicity, um, that, that it was a crisis with, that had to be addressed. Uh, and uh, it continues to be uh, my position. If we get this wrong, nothing else matters. And we certainly see that over the last few weeks, what's taken place uh, in our country, certainly since Memorial Day is highlighted. And look, at the end of the day, we have a choice as comprehensive research universities. We can either simply reflect society, which is what happens when you see these issues occur, or we can be our better selves, uh, or we can be a place where this is addressed with honesty and boldness and with the real plan. And that's the path that we've chosen. Uh, not to hope it goes away tomorrow, not to wish, as a lot of folks do, that there won't be another racist incident. And that's just lying to yourself. Racism happens every single day, every single day, not just on our campuses, but in society. And so the question becomes, not is it going to happen again, but what are we going to do to make true and real and meaningful systemic change? And so what we've done is this. Uh, we put together a, a true comprehensive plan. It's some 500 pages condensed to an executive summary that lays out objective outcomes and measures, how you measure success and how you measure failure to make real changes. We've created not just promoting to an executive officer level, our diversity and inclusion officer. The first move I made when I came in was to, was to elevate it to an executive officer, but to, to put in real positions that can make that change. So we have this comprehensive plan um, we just added over the last uh, last month and a half uh, someone on, on, in the provost's office who's focused on excellence and diversity and inclusion. Um, we are working on a, a new required class in our general education curriculum as students come into the University of Oklahoma that will help center them and gain an understanding of people not like themselves. And so the answer to this is not more speeches. The answer to this is not a program. The answer to this is not um, trying to avoid a problem in the future. The answer is to boldly and honestly look at the problems that are systemic, that are embedded in society, to address those honestly, to find out how they can be handled, to put a plan in place, and then to measure not just your sex successes, which college presidents are great at trumpeting, but also be honest about your failures um, and make progress. And so as we look at this, to me, this is fundamental, not just to our students, but our role as a comprehensive research university. If you look at the way people are trying to destroy our democracy, if you look at the way outside influences are trying to destroy our democracy, it centers on one game plan, and that is make us hate each other, make us hate the other, make us hate our differences rather than embracing them as a strength. And so to me, as a comprehensive research university with the students that have the greatest opportunity to make a change and difference in our society, our job isn't to just be adequate. Our job isn't to just make students, um, to remove barriers for students. But when you look at the top five pillars of our strategic plan that will launch over the next several weeks, an essential one of those is to make it a place of belonging and inclusion for all, where you learn about people not like yourself so that you can be not just a better student that feels more welcome on campus, but be an agent of change once you leave the universities for the greater good. So you, you said you want to, we want measurable improvement. What's the metric? How do you, how do you measure that? Oh, uh, across the range. So in our plan, it's everything from uh, the, the number of students that we're attracting, uh, the, the, the pool of students that we have, uh, the representation uh, across the enterprise. Um, and so it, it is, and it's not just in hiring, it's also in the classroom to make it more welcoming and acceptable. So it really is a broad range and, um, and it's not one specific area. It has to be a comprehensive plan. Uh -huh. I might oh, add, go ahead. add to that that uh, another measurable is graduation rates, retention rates. Uh, it's no secret that pe people of color tend to have 
lower retention rates and lower graduation rates. And that's just something that we need to address, not just bring these students to, to the university, but to get them a degree. And uh, that's that sometimes if they come from, if they come from certain circumstances, uh, they're gonna, they, they probably are gonna need more help than others. So, President Hargis, let's dig into this just a little bit more. Last week, uh, um, acting on your advice, the, the OSU regents voted to rename Murray Hall and North Murray Hall, uh, which had been named in honor of uh, Governor William Murray, whose record of racist segregation and advocacy for Jim Crow laws was, was just beyond the pale by current standards. President Harris, it wasn't that long ago that OU had to scratch the name of Edwin DeBar, uh, one of the school's first science professors who had an ugly association with the Ku Klux Klan off the front of one of its buildings, a building just around the corner from your own office. It, in both cases, the reason that we got was that black students need to go to go to a school where the atmosphere doesn't honor segregation and racial oppression. But when you start renaming buildings, you'll pretty quick get pushback from some who say you're trying to forget history. That's the phrase uh, I, I get from people on the telephone quite a bit, that you, you, you can't make this go away just by taking the name off of it. Uh, what the, is this just a symbolic act or, or, or is this a, a real thing? Uh, President Hargis, let's start with you. Well, the Murray, the Murray situation, well, let me, let me tell you, you said it was named in honor of, of Alfalfa Bill Murray. The truth is that uh, that's the only way Henry Bennett could get the money for this woman's dorm that he wanted to build that became Murray, Murray Hall. I mean, I, th I don't think we want to erase history or whitewash history. There's a lot of ways to keep that in the forefront. But as far as I'm concerned, when you name a building, it should be in honor of somebody. Somebody deserves the honor. And uh, clearly that's not the case with Alfalfa Bill Murray. Uh, the, uh, I think buildings ought to either tell you what's in them, business building, psychology building, or it should be in, in, in someone's honor. And what, what we were doing actually is um, had, a, have a, had a symbol of racism, of anti-Semitism, right on the corner of the entrance to campus. Now we also had a plaque we have a plaque and we will redo the plaque because of the name coming off, but it, it gives all the history of Alfalfa Bill Murray. And, and, and frankly, it wasn't all bad. I mean, he was a great champion of Native Americans and we, we recite that. But uh, the name that will go back on that building will either describe what's in it or will honor someone that deserves the honor. So uh, President Harris, uh, concerning, What's uh, what's going on at OU on this? I, the, you know, can you are you forgetting history? When, when, when you got any other names you need to rename? Any other buildings you need to rename? Yeah, you know, you, you spoke to to Debar, which I think was in '88 or '89, um, and uh, you know, like Burns says, I think he sums it up perfectly. It needs to either describe it or or, or bring honor to someone and. Uh, in that case, um, in the late 80s, uh, it became clear that DeBar was associated with the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, that's about as violent um, uh, uh, and reprehensible uh, a, an association as you can have. And so it certainly did not bring honor and did not speak to those values. And I think it, it goes back to your strategic plan, Wayne. I mean, as we think about this, um, when we think about what, what, what our goal is, and what the pillars are of our institution. Uh, for us, one of those, and I'm sure it's true for, for Burns and OSU as well, is that it wants to be a place of inclusion and belonging. And it's hard when you walk up towards uh, the office where the president is and you're passing Old Science Hall in the late 80s to walk past a building named for someone who was involved with the KKK to feel like you belong there. Uh, it just doesn't work. And so, uh, I think that's an example of a decision that you make, not in an effort to rewrite history, uh, but to articulate your present. So uh, we're, we're running short on time, gentlemen, but uh, yeah, I want to talk about money with you. Uh, the, the regents at both your schools have, have voted to freeze tuition, at least at your main campuses. A at the same time, though, appropriations to colleges and universities in the state are going to be down uh, essentially 4% next year. 
uh, and let's be honest, reduced state support of higher education is not a new thing in Oklahoma. That's been going on for, well, frankly, since 1968 and certainly for the last decade. At the same time, you've had some extraordinary expenses that are up uh, associated with COVID-19 and you know, just ordinary expenses uh, go up. President Harris, let's start with you. Your predecessor described OSU as being in a financial crisis and, and things haven't gotten, you know, a lot of things have gotten worse since then. Is, is OU on a firm financial footing? Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, people try and disaggregate the Health Science Center in Tulsa campus from Norman financially, but it, um, the truth of the matter is the Health Science Center is and has been in very good financial shape. Uh, the issue became Norman campus. And, uh, and so during Jim's tenure, uh, the university, we cut out $50 million in Norman campus operating expense. Uh, by the end of this month, in the next few weeks over this, this fiscal year, um, we will have cut an additional 25 to $27 million. Let's call it 25 million in Norman campus operating expenses. Um, the reality is you, is you positioned it is, Across the country, higher education has gone through a restructuring. Campuses have gotten more highly leveraged. And so taking that $75 million out was important. We've also not added any real debt because the balance sheet was already, um, already levered up. So where do we stand right now? The answer is um, uh, we are in good financial shape. Um, the key indicator has risen a lot in the last two years because of the cost cutting. We have more to do. Um, over the course of the next several years. And the goal is not just uh, to try and, and get the books to even. One of the things that we've had is basically a budget for the last 30 years that's always been 12 months at the longest in terms of planning. We're now looking at a five to seven year budget and asking where we need to be. So the goal, so the answer is the University of Oklahoma Health Science Center is in very, very good financial condition. Um, Norman campus, it has gotten a whole lot better over the last year and a half. But the goal is not stability. The goal is to actually accelerate your strategic plan, which is going to be expensive. And so what we look for is over the next year or two, um, with this being the third year in a row that Norman campus tuition and fees have been held flat, is, is how do we um, reposition our budget as a whole uh, in light of cuts from the state uh, to not just be financially healthy, but to actually achieve our strategic plan. And we are laser focused on that. Um, and so when I look at it again, to be clear, we are in, in you know, Norman campus is in good financial shape, but we're going to see over the course of the next year and a half is an acceleration into that uh, 75 million in cuts, uh, restructuring and, and, and focusing more on our strategic plan. President Hargis, luckily OSU has the magic money tree out on, uh, out on campus that, uh, that it can uh, go harvest uh, uh, every few days. And so you don't have any financial problems, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I got financial challenges. I wouldn't say I don't have problems. Uh, just, just to your point about the uh, funding this year, this year's funding for Oklahoma State, Stillwater, and Tulsa uh, is uh, we haven't had a, a number this low since 1996, and that's not that's not inflation adjusted. I mean, if you if you go back to what the what the 92 million dollars that we're getting this year. Uh, if you compare that to 96, the value back then would have been about $150 million. So we are, Oklahoma has disinvested in higher education dramatically. And to make this budget work with a 4% cut from the, the state, and by the way, one of the, you could say it's kind of a mixed blessing, uh, the state's appropriation is down to about 13% of our overall operation. I'd say when I was in school here, it was had to be up in the 70% range, just to show you how, how the disinvestment has happened. But of course, both OU and OSU got a, a very uh, handsome amount from the CARES Act. We were able to, uh, half the money we've used for student assistance, uh, the other half uh, reimbursed us, in our case, for the refunds that we did uh, for uh, fees and for room and board and meal plans. Uh, we're hopeful there'll be a little more CARES money come in that uh, the governor has to help out uh, for these increased cleaning expenses and the like that we're having to deal with. But we've had to go into our, our uh, reserve funds. Uh, our reserve funds are not as high as you would want them to be. 
uh, but we've had to access them. And uh, we also did a bond refunding uh, that has produced a, a very nice uh, stream of money over the next two or three years that uh, will help a lot. I think, I'm not sure, but I, I think our bond rating is higher than the state's bond rating. So we, we're not that we're gonna wanna put any, any more debt on, but it is, uh, it's important to have that access. Now you just can't keep doing this though, uh, without raising tuition and mandatory fees. And that, uh, that's hard on our families, that, that could be hard on enrollment. We have about 33% of our students come from out of state. Uh, that's, it's important that uh, we have that revenue uh, for the state for our operation. So we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna be fine this year, uh, barring some unforeseen problem. Uh, and the problem that you, if, you, if you had to go back fully online, uh, then, then you're gonna have a, a real challenge. Gentlemen, listen, thank you. You've been very generous with your time. You've been forthright with this. I, I really do appreciate it. Our, our guests today have been OU President Joe Harris Jr. and Oklahoma State University President Burns Hargis. Thank you too to our viewers and to our sponsor, the George Kaiser Family Foundation. Please join us again next week for our next Tulsa World Let's Talk Virtual Town Hall, featuring another discussion of the most pressing issues facing the state of Oklahoma. I'm Wayne Green, Editorial Pages Editor of the Tulsa World. Goodbye for now.